Commander Riker offers a rod of par steel. Data keeps his medals in a case. And Chief O'Brien's poker luck is always lousy until he starts on the dealer's right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, episode nine of season two, entitled The Measure of a Man, written by Melinda M. Snodgrass, directed by Robert Shearer. This is February 11th, 1989. We have a very special guest today. What luck it is writer Melinda M. Snodgrass. Hello, Melinda. Yay. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And we so really appreciate you. Yeah. Catch mm -hmm. up to make new friends because I haven't met you in Chirag. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, You'll we never get rid of them now, Melinda. I know, that's it. <laughs> never that's be able it. to shake them. They, they <laughs> don't already, I, I've already invited them to Santa Fe. So. <laughs> oh. God, yeah, God, I already God, booked my flight. Be careful, be careful what you what you wish for. I'm telling you, yeah. they're like Velcro. They're like Velcro. We're coming. We're coming. adorable <laughs> Velcro. <though. laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, this episode was sponsored by two of our very good friends, David Gregory and Anil O. Palat. Thank you so much for sponsoring this episode, Dave Gregory and Anil yeah. O. Palat. And of oh, course, wow. Denise is back. We're so grateful to have her back as our co-host. That's yes. it. Let's have a ton of fun together, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, Melinda, this is the first episode that you are credited uh, as a writer on The Next Generation. But I noticed after that, you are credited as it's seemingly part of the writer's room after that. Was it because of this episode that all the writers were like, whoa? Hang on a second. We need you. Or how did this come about? Uh, I have to roll back a little bit. Um, my best friend is George R. R. Martin, a little known writer. We're hoping that he'll break big here someday. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> and, uh, George had gone out to Hollywood to work on first the new Twilight Zone and then on Beauty and the Beast. And George called me one day from L.A. He was living out in L.A. And he called me and said, hey, Snod, um, I think you'd be real good at this screenwriting thing. And if you'll write a spec script, I'll show it to my agent. Now, I was a book author. I had quit being a lawyer. I was a novelist. You know, that's how I got to know George. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> so I um, looked around and had to decide what to write for. And I had grown up on Trek. I was a little kid. I loved original Trek. And I saw a new Trek was starting. And so I started watching. And and um, and George had given me all this, you know, he told me about how if you write a spec script, you never, ever, ever, ever sell your spec script. It's just a calling card. It'll just get you in the door to pitch. And um, as I was watching the show, I had been an attorney and constitutional law was my specialty. And as I was watching it, I thought, oh, my gosh, I can use the Dred Scott decision, which was an infamous Supreme Court decision, which ruled that a slave brought into a free territory was still just property. And he could not sue for his freedom, even though he was in now a free territory. And I thought I can use that for data. But. I called George and I said, look, I've got this idea for a script and I think it's really pretty good. And if I'm never going to sell it, maybe I should save it for pitching and write a different script because I have some other ideas. And George gave me the best advice I've ever gotten as a writer. He said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, hmm. meaning lead with the best thing you have, the thing you're most passionate about. And um, so I did. So I wrote The Measure of a Man. And wow. then he, you know, it got sent to his agent and his agent sent it to Trek. And then I got this phone call that they wanted to meet me and to come out to L.A. So I did. And I had all my cards with my extra, the other episodes I'd worked up. And um, when I met M Maury, uh, Morris Hurley, he I started to, he asked about me and, you know, my background and, you know, we were talking and then I said, well, I have these other ideas. And he went, Shh. and he pointed at the whiteboard behind his desk that had a list of the 
next episodes they were going to be shooting. And the Measure of a Man was on that shooting schedule. Wow. So I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, and then and then there was a hiccup. Uh, I we came home to New Mexico thinking, oh, I saw the script. And George is like, damn you, you, you made me a liar. I told you you'd never sell it. Um, <laughs> and then um, I get home and there was this weird hiccup where Gene decided to call and give me notes on the script. And the first thing he said to me was that there were no lawyers in the 24th century. <laughs> and that data would be delighted to be taken apart. And and I was like, so I just said to him, well, Mr. Roddenberry, then we don't have a script. <laughs> and, um, wow. and then Maury found out and got back on the phone with me. And Maury was like, get back out here right now. So I fly back to Los Angeles. And I sat in a meeting and they gave me notes, um, things to rewrite on the script for three hours. And they said, well, this won't work. What would you do? And at the end of the three hours, Maury said, I'm hiring you and you start on Monday. So I got hired for the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, wow. that was, that was um, and, and it was in, I mean, it was, you know, I was, I had been a lawyer. I'm used to making, you know, correcting, dealing with things on a timeline and, and on a schedule. Um, and also I've been a novelist. So, you know, you get notes and you make changes. And um, I mean, for example, I didn't have the poker game wasn't the initial teaser of my spec script. What was I, I uh. had data learning how to swim because <laughs> I thought you could read all the books, but you've never actually been in the water. And I had found out from Rick and from uh, Mike Akuda that data weighed like 400 plus pounds. So what I wanted, he's like, okay, I'm ready. Oh, and he gets in the pool and sinks like a stone. And then he has to walk across the bottom of the pool and comes up the other side. And Maury said, we can't do that. We suck at going on location first. He said, we are just are terrible at it. And he said, also Brent's makeup will wash off. So we need, you need a different teaser. They ended up actually using that in a in a subsequent, I don't remember if it was in an episode or a movie, but they actually ended up using that where data sinks to the bottom and and just walks out. I feel really? like it may I feel like it may have been a movie. I don't remember, but I remember that was so used. Then yes. I, well, then I needed something, so I came yeah. up with a poker game. Well, I mean, and first of all, why would data weigh 400 pounds? At this point, I mean, what you know, metal and all that stuff is getting lighter and lighter as we speak. I, I don't know. I mean, that was just what the tech guys who wrote the, you know, they had said he was, and I just thought it would be a funny moment. You know, I thought it would be oh, a funny totally. moment. Totally. It is. But, totally. Um, but they couldn't do it. So instead, they played poker. And uh, then it became this thing, you know, for all the rest of the show. Yeah. So, well, it became an integral you know, plot point in a, in a way, this poker game, you know, this, this yeah. significance of, of, you know, how you can yeah. read all, all you want, but at a certain point, you know, when do your senses kick in, you know, right. when do you fake, you know, when, when do you, when, when are you able to read the room kind of yeah. thing? It was a really nice kind of point about that. So it was, you know, the thing I could come up with that would, do the same thing for data to not understand bluffing and in you know, all of these these various yeah, things. So, yeah. So that's how I ended up on staff on Star Trek. Was wow, so you moved you moved from Santa Fe to I LA. Moved down to LA. Right yeah. then. Yeah, right then. I mean that was a Thursday they gave me notes and Maury said I had to start on Monday. So wow. I flew home, I packed up my car and I looked back to LA. Man. And you know, forever I mean Look, everybody is aware that Star Trek was not an easy show. I mean, it was, but I am grateful because it taught me new skills, thanks to Ira Baer, um, who really was my mentor, and Hans mm -hmm. Meimler and Rick Manning. Um, mm -hmm. I learned so much working with them, and it launched my Hollywood career. So despite the other stuff, it was still, right. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunities that it gave me. So. Absolutely, I get that. I believe me, I get that most of yeah. <laughs> more than anyone, more than most. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, 
You and I share a bond. Well, that. you know, had you been on the staff, I may have reconsidered. You know, I mean, you were not you were the missing a missing link because this script is tremendous. Tremendous. I mean, there are there are beautiful, beautiful lines um of that that just stop you in your tracks that, oh, that are written here. Yeah. And you know, that that that's what I was was looking for that wasn't uh, you know there in the in the first season. It was just, you know, not there. Yeah, so, I that was it was, you know, I I'm a very passionate writer and ultimately I ended up being too passionate for, for Trek. You mm. know, I was always running up against Rick saying, cut it down, cut it down. You know? mm. <laughs> no. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Melinda, I want to uh, give you a lot of credit for how wonderful this episode is. I, I want to say this is, uh, in my opinion, the best episode that I've watched so far leading up until this point. So that would be two seasons and eight episodes. I think it's the best, uh, the best written episode and really ta tackles some important keys that I think become uh, principal themes throughout Star Trek. And one of them is about uh, sentient beings and what is a sentient being. And I thought you made a very good kind of debate about the philosophical arguments of what a sentient being is, uh, a, a topic that's often covered in science fiction, but I thought you did a very good job in this episode with that. And yeah. also, yeah, I, I mean, it was, it, it, there were quotes all over this episode that I couldn't stop writing down, so there wasn't any wow. space in my notes. Wow. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's a but, lot of quotes. I did that too. Yeah. My notes are just yeah, full of too. quotes. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. And, and yeah, so that just to me tells me how great the writing is. And um, yeah, I felt as a viewer that you touched on some of the sensitivities of uh, what slavery kind of means to us when we look back on it. At least when I look back on it, I think of uh, being viewed as property. And that was one of the themes that was also well covered in this episode that struck a nerve for me was the idea of being considered property and not having a free will or the choice to decide where you go, what's going to happen to you. And uh, you use data as the vehicle for that storytelling, but still that is something that's happened for, uh, for human beings on this planet throughout time. And it's a real story that we've had to deal with as a society. So um, I want to credit you for just bringing that all of those key elements to this story and making this episode so enjoyable to watch. Um, let me ask you some of the challenges that I wanted to see how you dealt with. One of them is you had multiple characters that nobody had seen before, including the JAG officer Phillips, as well as the science guy, um, Bruce Alex. Maddox. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not and easy Admiral to introduce Nakamura. Right. At, uh, Admiral Nakamura as well. Mm -hmm. And um, did you run up against resistance for having these many new characters inside of this episode? Or was it something that was kind of part of the storytelling? No, it was it, nobody ever brought that up. Um, I mean, the, uh, you know, we weren't allowed to be in casting on Star Trek, but um, initially they were going to cast a sort of really pretty little blonde uh, to play Philippa. And Maury fought against that. He wanted somebody who came across as tougher, you know. And, and you know, I just hinted that there was a backstory between Picard and Philippa. Mm. You know, just I just sort of threw it in as a little hint. But, again, you don't play the backstory. If you're playing the backstory, then that ought to be the story, you know. That you shouldn't be messing with it. So I just sort of left that hint so that there was some tension and, and issues between them. Um, that could play out, but no, I, it, it went, it went fine. I mean, there was never a problem with it. Um, I mean, the biggest challenge was um, when I initially wrote the script, um, I didn't have Guinan in it. Uh, Whoopi wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was on the job. I'd moved to LA and we were getting ready to shoot and I got called into Maury's office and he said, uh, we've been looking over Whoopi's contract and she's 
got to be in 13 or whatever, 14 episodes. And if we don't put her in measure, we're not going to meet her con- our contractual obligation. So I need you to go write a scene for Guinan. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in many ways, that pressure, I spent like three and a half hours just pacing in my little office trying to, and then I figured out what I wanted to do. And I went downstairs and said, can I do this? This is what I, and Maury said, go write it. Um, and I think in some ways that's the heart of the, that scene is the heart of the script. Uh, there's um, no question, no question. Mm-hmm. She, you, you, in now you layer on that added element of you know the 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 enslaved people property, you know, and you're right. you're you you so seamlessly introduce those two very that will stand on their own apart right. from each other, the sentient being and the property now, and you layer that. You you weave that together in the in the trial. It was like I'm going, whoa, wow. Okay, we're here at this level, and now we've just dropped down another notch. In the yeah, and credit and credit to Whoopi in that performance as well yes. because oh, the way really? she yep. the way she delivers those lines, she doesn't oh. go over the top. She's not even angry. It's very no, it's, sort of it's almost it's a it's, yes. there's a sadness to her tone that's like, well, this is the reality, and, and that. That hit. I love yeah. too how, you know, she's clearly, we don't know a lot about Guinan, or at least, you know, when I was on the show, and the sense that she's taking Picard, who's almost like a child, that she's leading him toward the conclusion. Right. You know, this she's discovering. teaching him and helping him discover what's yeah. really at stake. And I just, I mean, her performance was just. Um, yeah, it, it takes your breath away. She was it amazing. Totally does. And she's so beautiful. She's so mm-hmm. elegant and beautiful. You can't yeah. take your eyes off of her, you know, her face, her skin. I mean, everything. I just you the camera is just, you know, loving her at this moment. Yeah. And the lines, the lines that you yeah, have disposable creatures that do the dirty work. Yeah. And you know, that's that's yes. that's, that's that's still a reality today um for a lot of people on this planet that feel that yes. sense of disposableness oh. and that are that feel like they're doing the dirty work and I, that's yeah. that's a real sentiment that I thought was hit very well I like the way Picard receives the information he hears it and then receives it but the way uh, Whoopi delivers it is just fantastic um and just the lines you can't seize people um you know talking about property I, another thing i wanted to ask you about melinda is that you inadvertently touched on something that is a very big topic today and that is <laughs> you know the pronoun identification with data being called mm, it yes it mm. was offending me every time i heard it it was it was <laughs> mm-hmm. bothering me me too <laughs> And and, wow. and 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 such a foresight for for and you didn't have a, a direct oh well, you did and there was a moment in which at the end uh, Doctor uh, Bruce Maddox says he's a you know he's an amazing guy or something to that effect and you bro- you 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 acknowledge the change in pronoun from it to he and mm-hmm. I, I just wanted to say that's another mm. uh, example of very clever writing and 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 also you identifying something. And hitting a nerve in the language with the pronouns. So I, I want to credit you uh, as well for that, Melinda. Of course, now I'm starting to get the feeling I hadn't even thought of that. So thank you. That's a really fascinating insight. And now I'm like, okay, is Florida going to ban Measure a Man? Is Florida not going <laughs> to show that episode again? Because we're dealing with issues of race and slavery and pronouns. And I'm like, Hmm. <laughs> you know, what's what's gonna happen? But but, feel, but feel yeah, proud. it's groundbreaking. I feel proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's true. If I got banned, would be great. And let me ask you also. Um, so now, as you're approaching and you're in on the staff, and you're becoming, you know, you're, you're part of the writing. Do you approach your scripts with the same uh, lawyer's eye? Uh, so are you thinking about when you're writing or when you're looking at scripts like, you know, how this impacts uh, the, the significance of how this will impact societally? Like, I think that was one of the things about brought up in this episode 
uh, where uh, Picard tells, um, you know, the judge in this case, Philippa, Philippa that mm -hmm. remember what this decision is going to mean going forward. It'll impact farther on down the line than just the one decision you have here which will affect our liberty and freedom. And that's one of the great you know, quotes of the episode as well. Um, do you now, do you approach the writing with that same kind of, the, how does this have an impact look, going forward um, for society and culture? Yeah, I do. Um, I, you know, I, I hated being a lawyer. I loved going to law school. I loved the study of law. I didn't like being a lawyer. But I have used it in almost all of my writing, my books, um, my scripts, um, because, you know, without law, you know, it's the foundation for civilization. You have to have some sort of agreements between people and um, and a way to, uh, you know, work out issues and debates and, and conflicts that are going to arise. Um, so, yeah, I do write with that in mind. And it's actually been one of the weaknesses of science fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly in prose for the longest time, is that we don't look at economics and we don't look at law. We, you know, are as always whiz bang, spaceships, aliens, fights, and so forth. But, you know, the way cultures are going to have to interact is to find a common, common ground, a place from which to negotiate. So, yeah, I think to some degree that's always, you know, playing in the back of my mind is what is this? And, you know, to, to, be a little critical here. They sort of threw all that away in the first season of Picard, which is the only one I watched. But it was like, oh, and look, we've built all these robots. And I was like, didn't you? Just, wasn't the whole thing <laughs> of Metro Man that you're not supposed to build an army of robots? And yet they based that season on on Measure of a Man, and then they kind of ignored the whole point of Measure of a Man, which was, you know, hey, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little bit baffled by by that, but uh, that choice. But hey, you know. They also uh, mentioned uh, Bruce Maddox. Uh, Bruce Maddox was in, I believe, a couple yeah, episodes the, of the first he season was the of the MacGuffin. Part. They were all looking for Bruce Maddox. He was oh, like the yeah. ultimate MacGuffin. In, mm -hmm. in, yeah. Yeah, there and are a lot of things. Started. Just yeah. very quickly, yeah. Melinda, there are so many things in this one episode that you started for all of Star Trek. Bruce Maddox, for example. Uh Admiral Nakamura is in a couple more episodes. Uh the uh data sink into the bottom of a lake. Uh, but the big one that I noticed was the poker game. I don't believe they played it played poker in any of the, the episodes before no. this. But First since appearance. that, it became kind of a hallmark of the next generation. It was the heart of next generation. There are so many episodes that include that. And that's even how Star Trek Picard series, spoilers, ends with a poker game. Yes. And I, when I saw this here, I realized, are mm -hmm. you the person that created this whole poker lore for the next yeah. generation? Yes, that's oh, unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> you got to hang your hat on that. It is huge. Right? And, and, and where and where does your uh, interest, knowledge of poker come from? <laughs> <laughs> um, mostly it's because I thought it would be more interesting. I played bridge. I'm not much of a gambler. So I was okay. a bridge player, but I thought it would be fun, you know, because I needed something with bluffing, you know, because bridge is mm -hmm. all about betting and, you know, um, and it, it's all right out there. I wanted something where data would be puzzled, um, but but you didn't have anything. No, that's the whole point, data. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. So poker yeah. was the logical, you know, conclusion. And also, I've had friends. I mean, George, who started all this with me. Uh, George used to love to. I mean, he was a big poker player at science fiction conventions. He and some of the guys, you know. And so I, you know, I'm aware of it. And um, yeah. but not necessarily a player myself but it just seemed like the right choice to to get across what i wanted to get across so that's what i did no. the bluff the bluff can i can i ask um where was that your um idea to to bring tasha's hologram up yes 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 so you <laughs> had you had seen or you had you were aware of of our relationship I, watched all of the episodes before uh, I ever tried to I, I watched all the episodes and 
I have done some acting, stage acting. I was a singer. I, I studied opera in Europe before I came back and went to law school. So I've done all these crazy things. Very cool. Um, and so I had watched all the episodes and I also practiced while I watched repeating the lines in the way all of you talked so that I nice. knew how to mm -hmm. do it. I mean, I still say all my dialogue aloud, whether I'm writing a script mm -hmm. or a novel, but I would play it, repeat it, stop the tape, you know, or stop the recording, repeat the line, listen again, so that I got the rhythm of how people talked for the show. So I was very aware of the relationship between Data and Tasha. And so, you know, I wanted that as he was like, you know, it reminds me of her, not that it's an emotional thing for him, but that it was a memory he wants to keep in his memory banks of right. her. So right. that was, you know, because that's always the balance with data is you can't make him emotional, but you also, I mean, humans are watching this. And, you know, if he was just a computer, he wouldn't be terrible. I mean, to be honest, he was the most, by the time I got to the show, he was always the most interesting character, which is kind of sad because he was a robot. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, he wanted to learn and change and understand yeah. humans so there was some growth for him and right. everybody else was just so perfect <laughs> you know exactly that's what i was always fighting against by the way but but back to that hologram that so and now we come to the end of you know the third season picard and and the hologram reappears mm-hmm I, yeah. Again, I, I, I only know I haven't yeah. seen it either, but but I have I know about that. You know, does. everybody. Yeah. We, we've we seen it. it. And yeah. spoiler. Yes. Tasha's hologram does come back again in the season three of Picard. So again, right. Melinda, they reuse your idea yes. once again, yeah. including all the from program, one episode, including this the hologram. Amazing. <laughs> so, and, and that uh, hologram. <laughs> That ho that because of that hologram, because data has that cube, and that hologram speaks volumes in terms of the um, the 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 story, the definitive storyline of this of of what the next generation is. You know, you know that now there is this deepening and this resonance. Be, between the these two characters because of that hologram right, you know, right. that yeah. that that he holds that that has huge significance and to mm -hmm. include that in picard you know i talked to terry metallis about it he he as, as a child was is watching the next gen right you know, as a little yeah. boy yeah. dreaming yeah. of one day writing for this show that he wow. takes that and brings it with him into when he's able to do it. Maybe so that's a card, you know, could I have a little card somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like with the card I really did, based on the script, Measure of a Man, right. by Stodgrass. Right. Uh, yeah. I, well, well, everyone I, knows I, that. that. I'm, I'm so glad that that, that, that happened, that, um, that, you know, that relationship and that Tasha and you just weren't erased out of Star Trek lore, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Thank you. And and, and Brent, Thank by you. the way, played that <laughs> moment very well too. I want to give Brent his credit because I will agree with you, Melinda. I do feel like uh, sorry, Brent Spiner's character uh, really was a big central, you know, engine driving this show. And um, one of the things that I thought he did well was play that moment. And I thought the moment itself was written very well because he pauses when the hologram comes up and he mm -hmm. says, uh, they're like, well, who is this? And he, he says something to the effect of, uh, well, she's uh, someone special to me, you know? Um, and there was a sensitivity there. And he said, I'd rather not, I'd rather not tell you what happened right right yeah. because there's a privacy there as well 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, respects like, that and the, the experience they shared. And so, yeah. Right. And then he finally gives it up because Picard looks at him like, bro, you're about to die. If you don't say something. <laughs> yeah. And so, he's like, I think she'll be okay with it under the circumstances. Yeah, that was <laughs> yeah. sweet. Yeah. That was very sweet. Yes. I that thought Picard it was a great. said Tasha would be okay with it. Yes. I like the way you wrote that because it, it it played out well, in my opinion, yeah. because it, it it he was protecting his secret with her and his moment with her, but he was also respectfully giving away the details without being, um, I thought, um, overly repulsive in a masculine way, kind of, you know. Um, yeah. That's where another thing that you bring to the table, Melinda, is, is the uh, sensitivity of a woman because in the beginning of these episodes, we saw a heavy lean towards a male chauvinistic point of view in the first season of this next generation. And we have been um, looking for more uh, balanced kind of approach to the storytelling. I felt like there was a more chauvinistic point. I know DC Fontana was there and there were other people doing things, but I felt like you had more of an understanding about how to approach certain situations for example how did the how were you able to convince roddenberry that lawyers do exist in the future (laughs) i was really lucky gene got sick and he was (laughs) not around for six weeks and in that six weeks period they got that script to the to the set and they shot it, and then it was too late. And the oh. funny thing was, I was on a panel with David Gerald, who wrote The Trouble of Tribbles. Mm-hmm. And so it's David Gerald, George Martin, and me on this panel. Wow. And I tell the story about, well, Gene got sick, and he wasn't around, and so we were able to shoot the show as I wrote it, rather than it getting you know torn apart. And, and David <laughs> looks over and he says, you know, when I did Tribbles, Gene hated the trouble with Tribbles because Star Trek wasn't funny, but he went on vacation for three weeks and we shot it while he was on <laughs> And George is sitting between us and he just starts howling with laughter like, oh my God, you know, it's like <laughs> two of the scripts that people love got through yeah. because, you know, right. they managed to sneak them through. Um, mm. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, Gene... <laughs> It was the whole, like the whole no money thing made me crazy. And the fact that people were perfect. I mean, you know, I, what measure did I was able to have conflict between the characters. I was able to have Picard and Riker on, on opposite sides. Mm, And and that was such a nice change from everybody just being so, you know, we're all together. (laughs) Right. Even even Picard and Philippa had a conflict there. There yeah. was yeah. that, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, butting just, of heads. She brought back this the idea of this uh, this the stargazer. You actually brought that up again. Another kind of recall in the script where you're bringing back um, storyline that we've heard before. Yeah, yeah, just trying to you know give some sense that there's depth and people interact with each other, and you know that yes. was what I wanted. So yeah. yeah. Well, that, uh, that's it's interesting. It's interesting looking at um, uh, Amanda McBroom, I, who plays um, Philippa. Philippa. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys have similar. You, you have similar coloring and qualities. I didn't know she was. I mean, since we weren't permitted, in I mean, she'd be like you. You know, she was you, cast I, to be you. I think I yeah. that's what you, it seemed I'm like, like to me too. Uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if more no, would have tried to find a redhead or what, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, mm. Isn't so, that uh, uh, interesting? Yeah. Well, like uh, you're doing the role, Melinda. Yeah. Uh, boy, oh boy, this has been so much fun, and we have so much more to talk with you about. So we hope that you will come back. Uh, many more times. We have a few more excuses to have you back in the future. So hopefully uh, you will be joining us again. But this has been amazing. Uh, You wrote an amazing script. You made us laugh. Uh, You changed the course of Star Trek. And that's not an exaggeration. You actually did change the course of Star Trek. Still to this day, we're feeling the effects of it and the references. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you so much for having me. It was lovely getting to know you two gentlemen and getting to see Denise and chat. And, and I hope they get everything fixed at the house with all the rain. You did, you so did a fantastic fun. job in this episode. We, I loved it from start to finish. Yeah. Um, really a highlight of this uh, first two seasons for me. And I uh, just wanted to congratulate you on the ineffable quality. <laughs> to to oh, use well, one of your lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say this. Data is a toaster. <laughs> data is a toaster. Yeah. Data yeah. Is a toaster. Yeah. Uh, I laughed out loud. <laughs> you said it so yeah. matter of factly, you know, exclamation yeah. point. Okay. He's a toaster. <laughs> So, Melinda, uh, we've heaped praise on you just now. After you're gone, we're going to continue to heap more praise on you. Uh, yeah. But, again, thank you so much for this. We hope to see you again real soon. Everybody stick around. Uh, we've got a lot more coverage of this glorious episode, and we'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. And welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Denise Crosby. Hello. We've got a Hello, lot more kids. fun happening right now, starting with the trivioids yeah. very quickly. Not a ton of them this week. The Enterprise is en route to newly established Starbase 173 for port call. Chief O'Brien's poker luck is always lousy unless he starts on the dealer's mm -hmm. right. Philippa Louvois is in charge of the 23rd Sector JAG office. Commander Riker offers a rod of bar steel. Uh, we are all manage we are all machines of a different type. Data keeps his medals in a case. Data keeps a hologram of Tasha Yar, and Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Wow. Um, yeah. So let's just get back into this. I was really excited for you both to see this episode. I had not seen it in decades. I'd only seen it once. And uh, as a child, you know, I was like, okay, uh, it's a, one of those courtroom things. So, you know, kind of went over my head a bit, but I was aware this was one of the best episodes in Star Trek history. Some people say it is the best. So I was really excited to see it now with adult eyes. I was really excited for the both of you to see this and be blown away. Like this came out of the second season of Next Generation. <laughs> How did that right. happen? Right. Yeah. yeah, first time for me. Mm -hmm. I've never, uh, never, never saw it. Uh, had heard about it, obviously, over the years of doing cons and being up on stage and people asking, you know, what do you think is the best episode? What's your favorite episode? And I was, you know, measure the measure of a man always, always was in there. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was, uh, I was really delighted to to see the level of 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 writing and um the tenderness and the and the moments shared you know it was just uh a, a beautifully illustrated you know themed episode beautifully mm. done and i had never seen uh pulaski you know i'd never right. seen I, I i had only seen whoopee when i was you know which i won't give any spoilers away but you know i had I, I later right. on, and, you know, so it was, um, it was, it was a lot of new, a lot of new stuff for me to, to watch. And again, see, seeing it at this distance, you know, safely, not, you know, where it, where it stirs, um, all of the stuff that I was, was, would, would have been going through, uh, you know, while in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, you're in the episode, so you're in yeah. one of the best episodes, <laughs> even though again, you're not as big again. as you normally are. Yeah, but it, it wasn't <laughs> just can't... that little hologram, yeah. but it was just your yeah. your legacy that you left and yes. how you affected Data and how he was sticking to that you know promise. And just real quick, Sorak, I know you were leading to something, but since you bring that up. I really thought that Melinda gave you that closure that you seemed to tell us you wished for in in his, your final episode when you said you wanted to come up and say, and Data 
it did happen. Like you wanted That's... to, you wanted Tasha Yar, you wanted that a- acknowledgement for data to not be like, okay, last thing he ever heard was it never happened. Right. And so he's just kind of got this wall up to where he can never express that. And you wanted him to get that acknowledgement. And, and they said, no, not keeping it, not, not doing it. And yes, I feel like I this gave you that. Ab- very astute observation, Ryan. And, and yeah. yes, I, I didn't, I didn't want it to end with him thinking that I didn't acknowledge it. You know, that's, I wanted him to know that I, you and I are in the same, on the same page. You know, we both had this experience and I want you to know that, you know, I was, I was embarrassed by my act. You know, it's like the night that you wake up drunk, you know, from a drunken night and you're, you look over and, oh my God, who is this next to me? <laughs> you know, and you, Riker, you go, how did that happen again? <laughs> I, I, I gotta stop, you know, this is, I really got to get a hold of myself, you know, that's, I mean, that's kind of where Tasha was, you know, coming the morning after, you know, like, oh, she's back in her uh, security, security mode and, and slightly embarrassed of, of her, her vulnerability, basically, you know, this other side of her. So I, I, I there, you're right that, that she did, she, by, by doing that, it, it it not only introduces this 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 theme for the rest of the show into Picard as we as we see, but you know it it um, it really has a um, significant impact in in Data's you know life that will won't go away. Yeah, and and I have to say what um, what Melinda was saying about. Um, the characters being um, kind of stuck in their way or they're already solidified in their way, but data we're seeing more. He's like, there's growth to him because everything is a new experience. Right. And he's always like, Oh, what is that? And tell me about this. And, you know, and so there's that kind of curiosity that he represents uh, And that same curiosity is the one we have as the audience, right? We are also curious what's going on in space, what's happening on the station. And, you know, what's that, what's that, you know? And so Mm -hmm. we also have that. And I felt like uh, Brent, you know, I always give him his credit because he's so amazing. And uh, I did tell him that in Vegas this last time about about how amazing I think he is. And one of the things that he did when Bruce Maddox tells Picard, yeah, I'm here and we're going to disassemble data for the first time that he hears that. The look on Data's face was like a like a child, mm. and it was like you know like there was a helplessness, a child like, mm. and he was looking at Picard like you're going to let him do that to me like a, as if you know there was a real kind of innocence on his face that he was able to capture that uh, expression to me in a very real way, and even the way he argues for his own defense you know by talking about LaForge's eyes. You know, he's like, well, LaForge, you know, Jordy has, you know, his vision is better than normalized, right? How come everybody doesn't get those? So I, I just, th- those kinds of um, mm-hmm. arguments that he was posing, I thought, made it really uh, special. Even when he says he comes around the corner and he sees uh, Maddox kind of digging with his book. And he's like, don't you have to ask permission to go through somebody's stuff? There was some kind of exchange with that. These showed me all signs about how human data really is and i think that's what tasha brings up for me it shows me that data is more human than robot in those kind of way where he's he's you know he's 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 had an emotional connection with somebody a physical connection he has these kinds of curiosities like a child um so these are like qualities that are human you know i think i think what we're also experiencing in watching this is sometimes data is more human than the humans and what you know what what is going on too which i love is is within the other characters their their connection with data what they're navigating 
is their own struggle with accepting that, yeah, re- the reality is this is an android, but he is not, a, he, we're, he's not an android. He is my friend. You know, Riker says he is my friend, but which basically he's saying, I love, he is, he is one of me. He is, you know, a, he is one of us, you know, yeah. so it's, it's their, it's their, um, um conflict within themselves that they're always having and and this exemplifies the perfect dilemma for them at this moment because they want to he no 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 we're taking this this is this is a machine this is just a machine we've got to we've got to technically you know d- break this thing up and disassemble it and and look inside but they're so you know the rest of the crew is so personally invested and connected to this friend so it's 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 a wonderful you know dilemma that's introduced all the time and then and then to Mm -hmm. to kind of echo your point about data being more human than human sometimes when he is going when his belongings are being you know kind of displayed by picard and he says and what are these and those are my medals and uh Data says, is that vanity? Right. He literally questions it, you know, like, is it vain for right. me to That's self-awareness. collect my medals? That's a self-awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I thought that's a great thing. And then, and then the book, he said, what about this <laughs> book? And he says, well, that was a gift that you gave me, you know, and it, it represents friendship and service. So. And that's know. sentimentality. Another yes, very human. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. And, and then he brings out the hologram of Tasha Yard, and so these are all human sides of data, right. where he's exploring his own version of humanity, his own, you know, toaster version of <laughs> of, of humanity. Yes, and- but it's something new. It's it's new life, like. Picard was making the argument um, in his closing statement about exploring a new life. That's right. And Philippa, Philippa, towards the end, you know, sizes it all up, you know, for us in that it's up to him now to find the soul, to develop the, that's, that's for that data to, to, you know, experience now, explore mm. it. If in fact he has a soul, she says, I don't even know if I have a soul. That was a great line as well. Too. My yep. God. Yes. You know, we're told that, but you know, what, what does that mean for each one of us? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, but you know, that was another thing. Soul? <laughs> I was just, R- Riker didn't have a soul. Sorry. No, he was just doing his job. Actually, that was a, a question I wanted to ask yeah. uh, Melinda, but I was like, there's way too much to talk about than these yeah. these details. But like, I, I thought that that's a lot, you know, that's something that an attorney would come up with is yeah. forcing somebody to take a side that they don't maybe subscribe to necessarily, but he's being forced to do it because otherwise, right. you know, so they, they explained that. Very well. I also want to point yeah. out very quickly yeah. that you both mentioned more human than human. Shout out to White Zombie. That's a great White Zombie song, More Human Than Human. I just know that everybody's <laughs> very excited that you both yeah. mentioned that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the line that when what Picard said, and there's way too many to quote them all, but when he points at data and he says, No, what what is he? He says, What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? Do you? And it was just so beautifully delivered, well written, loved it. And and the line, uh, Sirach, you were referencing when he says, uh, you know, we, our principle is to, what is it? Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it Uh sits. Right. And I feel like that was kind of like the checkmate moment, right? I loved that. Yeah. Uh, The way also the chemistry between Duck, uh, Philippa, I want to keep calling when I call her Dr. Philippa, <laughs> but uh, the the judge Philippa, let's say, um, and Picard, I thought it was written very well. There was a moment where they were meeting each other and he says, she says, uh, he says, you know, I, well, you know what I feel like doing? And she, she said, oh, you want to bust the chair across my teeth? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, after that. And I was, <laughs> like, 
after that. Oh. <laughs> like this, the, their, the contention kinky. in their relationship was kind of like, whoa, okay. The card's a and little she, kinky. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, um, she says to him, she calls him, you're such a pompous ass yeah. and damn sexy man or something. I to that know. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, this is, where's this going? This yeah. is, I these know. guys are savages. They're Klingons, practically. I, I should have. I wanted yeah, to. Yeah, they're practically Klingons. Exactly. I wanted to ask Melinda if that was her line, or is that you know one of the added lines of the other? You know, to just interject because they're 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 trying to you know p- p- give Picard that you know heroism that that put him up in kind of sexy. Mm-hmm. Anytime they can sex him up a little bit, you know, looking for sex up moments. So that was clearly a little, you know, nod to that. So, you know, we got it. We got it. (laughs) The the, the part I thought was cold blooded was when Riker says uh, Pinocchio is broken. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought I thought that was excessively harsh language that didn't need to be like he could have proved his point he turned him off and said okay it's you just a machine i thought I, that was like almost like trying to sting i think you're so right because that's really well thought thought out because if in fact riker is torn you know torn up that he has to do this he would all, you know, he's only doing it because the alternative was was unthinkable. OK, mm-hmm. so he's going to do this in hopes that Picard is even better than him. Yeah. That he's got it, yeah. He's gonna do. So with data being off, why would he be even harsher? Like right. who's he saying that to? All, all, all he had to do is say, I, I, "I." All he had to do is yeah. say, "I rest my case." State is a machine. Exactly. I rest my case. Exactly. And then he could have walked very, away. Very well. Well. But, uh, but the Pinocchio is broken. Yeah. Is a is a heart. It's 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 language that's used to tear somebody down. It's, Absolutely. It's destructive language. And I thought, why are you taking why? a low blow on him? And you know. Yeah, especially when this is something you don't want to do. I can hear, right. I can hear Maddox saying that Bruce sure. Maddox. I can hear him chiming in from the sideline. Absolutely, because you know, that's, that yeah, yeah, that's, that's how he feels. Yeah, that's how he feels. That's not how Riker feels. No, no, it would have been great at if all. That line came from Maddox. If he had said that, I would have bought it. I didn't like Riker saying it, be, and he, he was like cold blooded about it. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. It's too much, but um, there were so many good things. I, I love how Picard essentially is standing up for Data's rights. Yeah, and and to me, this is this is one of his best qualities, and this is an example. Um, Picard showing real leadership to me, like this is a leadership quality. This is when you stand up for someone and you say, "I'm going to find a way." Uh, what mm-hmm. can Data do? Can he resign or make him resign? Uh, he's not, you know, finding a way is the leadership quality in Picard saying, OK, well, I'm not going to quit there. I'm going to we'll go to trial. We'll do this. We'll do that. Um, that's what a leader does. He finds whatever means are at his disposal that are, you know, within the rules and with the bound within boundaries to try to get his point across and convince people. Uh, about what's right that's the leadership not forcing yeah. somebody to believe what's right but actually convincing them in a in a in an argument when you know what yeah i thought that this was the most convincing argument if you will for making picard likable uh mm-hmm. this episode i feel like this was the most likable that he has been written out of the first you know 30 or so episodes this would they were the most successful at making him a character that we really like uh, in this one. I yes. I personally thought I was mm, like, this is mm. this is a guy that, you know, he's got a good moral compass. He's smart. He's compassionate. Very different from the guy we were introduced to, you know, in the first few seasons that was just kind of a grumpy Gussie. Yeah. But, and incredibly loyal. Incredibly yes, loyal to his A lot grade. of heart there, yeah. Yeah. However, guess what, everybody? It's time for the home run of the episode. <laughs> 
we can't get it's out of that too long it's i know long. that's why i was looking yeah. right at you when i said that. <laughs> oh you silly goose denise who gets oh, the home boy. run of the episode today wow i gotta give it to data he just you know he really just you know this is his episode um it just really gives him some a lot to to ponder a lot of sides of him to um you know to to expose to 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 you know question to to we see these this sort of prism of how he how he conducts himself in this world and and it was very it was very touching he was very very um uh loving in this in this episode mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I give him the the home run leave it to steroids. leave it to tasha <laughs> yard to talk about every side of data being exposed not in that way oh my not mistake. in that way <laughs> uh, um yeah you know i'm i'm gonna give this one uh to Melinda Snodgrass, mm -hmm. you know, she wrote this episode on her own, uh, came up with some very important themes that uh, continue to resonate throughout the Star Trek uh, community all these years later. Mm -hmm. um, and also having to, um, you know, really go from being an, an, an unknown um, television writer you know, to just breaking in with this kind of a script, with this quality of a story. Um, I'm going to say that she gets the home run for me. Also having to bat butt heads against Roddenberry and, and the likes in order to get her uh, message across and staying strong with her themes that she fought for. Um, and also the idea that she took the Dred Scott decision and took mm -hmm. that real legal precedence and turned it into a science fiction episode. And that to me is, is, is a, a kind of uh, genius that I like to see on display. It takes something very real and puts it in the context of fantasy and allows us to um, think about these kinds of uh, subject matter in a way that we normally wouldn't. And uh, that's why I'm going to give Melinda Snodgrass the home run of the day. Mm -hmm. uh yeah i'm i'm down with melinda m snodgrass that's the home run of the day for me uh not just because of what an incredible episode that she wrote that still resonates to this very day everybody's constantly still talking about it um but that she yeah like srock said uh she created these themes that are still going like the poker you know t game i mean that wasn't just revisited in picard it was through it was almost like the heart of the next generation it represents the next generation a lot of things that she came up with but also because it almost felt like and i can't really put myself back in what you know the viewers were feeling in 1989 it felt like it gave the next generation a pulse it felt like it was kind of hovering down here and then it, bing it got like a really and i feel like there were maybe some mm. people in 1989 that just kind of stopped and caught themselves like leaning forward a bit saying holy mm. shit this show can be really good or you know that's what i'm thinking that's what it feels like but home run of the day for her can't say enough good things but we can say enough good things about these incredible people wait that doesn't sound like a compliment i meant it as one <laughs> and they are homer frizzell dr <laughs> Anne marie siegel eve england out in wales uh, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin. <laughs> Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka. Akasaka. Our good pal Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manosfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, and of course, 
Dr. Susan V. Gruner, and Jason the Outrageous Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got the free for all uh, coming up next. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be a lot of compliments. Somebody's going to say this episode was terrible. It's probably going to be no, nobody's going to say Homer. that. <laughs> probably <laughs> Homer. <laughs> He's there. Homer. All right, everybody, uh, stick around. We will be right back on the seventh rule. Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. Denise Crosby, Sirach Lofton. Of course, uh, this is the free for all. Look who's here. It's Melissa Longo. We've got TJ Jackson Bay. I'll just bet he's in Missouri. Nice background, TJ. <laughs> Everybody listening, yeah. he's got an identical background to Sirach. That's pretty awesome. That's Imo Radka style right there. Uh, we've got Chris McGee here, uh, Allison Leach Hyde as well. We've got Eve England out in Wales, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Mai is live in Tokyo, probably, Carrie Schwent, Crafty Bear. We've got Justin Weir, aka Shag840. Faith Howell is hanging out on the Enterprise D. Uh, Goldu Scott Jensen is here. And of course, Jason, the outrageous Oaken. All right, everybody. <laughs> so, first things first. Uh, Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. Mm. Um, I'm going to say like an eight point two. I'm going to say eight point two. Getting a lot of nods. Does anybody else have any guesses that doesn't already know? No, this one goes to eleven. <laughs> I'm gonna go eight nine eight. one on this one. That's a ten from two. All right. The answer is it's definitely taller than any NBA player. I'll tell you that much. It is a <laughs> nine point one. Wow. 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 That's because wow. Denise that the, showed up. Is that the highest score <laughs> so far? Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Not a TJ, Not what did you call. say? I said nine, nine one. Point one. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Wow. Excellent. Also, did everybody catch the non-appearance mentions today? I got two. It was uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Noonien Sung and oh, right. Lore. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are any others. Mm -hmm. Unless you count the Stargazer. Bit. Yeah. Considered. I, I do feel like the Stargazer is a character, but there's another. Oh, Homer would be pissed. Oh, there's another? What Ooh. do we got? Yes. Uh it was a little little known security officer named Tasha Yar. But there, oh, there was an appearance. Was in it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's did why he, I said did he actually turn it, it on? was so good. It was yeah, yeah, he did turn it on. Yeah. Did turn oh, he did all right. Yeah. <laughs> he turned it on, baby. He turned <laughs> it, it on. It. <laughs> Holy so God. Here, God. Here's my home <laughs> argument for this. <laughs> Intimately, <laughs> Denise Crosby, the actor, was not recorded in this episode, True. and so it's okay. still a non appearance mention. Oh, we need Homer. Yeah, I, I have a feeling Homer would get whiplash shaking his head on this one, but we'll ask him. We'll <laughs> ask him when he gets back. Well, then we'll we'll have to add Pinocchio to that list then. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Pinocchio, Pinocchio strings are cut. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Melissa Longo, what's mm. up? Radical shirt. What did you think of this episode? I love this episode. <laughs> I love this episode. It's probably... Um, one of my favorite Star Trek episodes of all time, um, just because it's that good. I, I love episodes that are like this, that are kind of stripped down, that are kind of bare bones and they look at the, the humanity of us all. And, um, and I, and for me, an episode like this represents what Star Trek really is about um and and it's the exploration of what it means to be alive and what classifies a life um and i love that star trek explores that um it, it, in every aspect it possibly can um i love that and and i love that it explores the idea that 
one life isn't more important than another life. And, um, and, and I felt that very strongly in this episode. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it was great. The scene between Guinan and Picard blew me away. I watched that probably <laughs> more times than I could count. But um, the when Picard says the word property, it it hit me in the head in the face like a ton of bricks it, because they, it was so weighted and there was so much subtext behind that word and, and it meant so much um, and and it in, encompassed what this whole episode was about and and. Um, yeah and that exploration of life and i have so much more that i could say about this episode <laughs> i'm gonna have to save it but all good stuff i love 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 everybody mm -hmm. in this episode every performance and i love the the tribute to tasha and how she was included in that as well so yeah great episode excellent mm -hmm. thank you melissa good stuff can't wait for the rest of it uh, <laughs> I'd like to call uh, Eve England out in Wales to the stand. Uh, Eve England, <laughs> you uh, you are an attorney, are you not? I am, but not this kind of attorney. Mm -hmm. I've never mm -hmm. once been in a court, but I, I did like some of the legal stuff in this. Mm -hmm. And I might well spend a little bit more than two minutes because I I really enjoyed this episode and definitely the best TNG episode since Conspiracy, which um, I, I'm. You know, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the heads up, Brian, to watch it because um, obviously I haven't seen it before. And yeah, it was just so, so fascinating. And I feel like I need to watch it again because I'm sure there's so, so, so much more complexity in the layers that I probably didn't pick up the first time. So definitely going to go back and rewatch this. Um, so I've got a few points to say, but I just to sort of start off with a sort of slight disappointment that I had with this. But I appreciate the reason they did it. They didn't do this was timings, but I would have loved them to have had. Dr. Pulaski come and defend Data because I feel that her character would have brought so much weight to that argument because she, you know, as we know, she started off just treating him as this robot. But by this episode, she's there then as one of his chosen friends to, you know, at, at, at his leaving party, which I think tells a great deal about how she's been a mentor and as, you know, she's constantly pushing him to explore his humanity. So I would have loved to have seen that, but appreciate, you know, they wanted to keep it a bit tighter for that. Great point. Um, yeah, and I just I just love that. And I, you know, I would have just loved to see more of her because you all know I'm a big fan. Um, but in terms of some of the points that I that sort of struck me when I was watching it, the first just seemed I thought it was a bit odd how such a momentous kind of decision, a legal, you know, a, a key legal principle was almost made summarily by that captain without any due process or any kind of third parties getting involved. So I thought that was quite interesting sort of in terms of a criticism of the federation and you know is what really is their legal system like if, if they can just have one person making this kind of decision without a proper hearing and time to prepare etc and then related to that i thought mm, it sort of made me think about the voyager episode where the doctor is <clears> arguing <throat> that he could have ip <clears throat> rights and i was like and i don't recall and maybe i've only seen that episode once as well so i might need to go back but i was thinking surely this this episode would have been would have established some sort of legal precedent for mm. that case. And I don't think they mentioned it, but I'm going to go back and, and double check because I thought that was quite interesting as well. Um, and as Melissa said, I just loved all the philosophical aspects and that that reference to property and, you know, the weight that that carries in terms of, you know, our fairly recent history. Um, and it certainly reminded me of other shows, you know, how Star Wars, you know, uses the clone army, uses their droids and just treats them as, dis dis you know, dispensable and they're expendable. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And there's also a British TV show called Humans, which is kind of based in the sort of near future mm -hmm. where there's androids. And then it's all about that because we're basically just using them for slaves for all sorts of awful things. Um, so, you know, the, it's just such relevant conversations and topics to explore. And I just thought the way they distilled that right down, as you said, Melissa, it's just so interesting, so powerful. Um, and then I'm not going to be here for the things left and said. So if you'll just bear with me. The one criticism I had with this whole episode was how that captain ruined her put down of Picard. I was like, you're saying he's a pompous ass. And then you go and say he's sexy. I was like, no, 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 you have to ruin this. I was like, I what picked, are you doing? Eve, I pictured you getting mad at that too. I knew you would. 
And I brought that up. Okay, I brought that up. That's so inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to find out, was that an add-on, <laughs> you know, uh, by one of the producers just to sex up Picard? Uh, you know, they're always yeah. trying to, you know, make him juicy and sexy and, you know, make sure we get that he's sexy, you know. Yeah, because and it's, and it just, we can't I just make felt, up our own minds, so we have to have so, someone say it. It was just so odd, wasn't it? And I just thought, you know, he's just he just, and I know that there was a, I can't remember which episode it was, but he was sort of going on a, about Pulaski and was speaking to Troy about you know whether she was doing her job properly. And I just, I think the way it's been presented so far is that he seems to have an issue with women and authority anyway, and he doesn't seem to speak to them with the respect I think we would have if this show was being done now. So yeah, that yeah. It, it did it did annoy me how I, I was I was I was actually and James was there and I was like he, when she called him I was like yes this is brilliant and then she goes oh and you're very sexy I was like, oh no yeah I shook my head at that one that was it but that's yeah. the only that was the only negative point I had for the whole episode which I think you know for me is probably a really um really positive thing well she so couldn't love say that to you couldn't even say that to a man right now no um, you know he'd call you out he'd call you on that and you know, be able to have every right to do so. Mm. You know, yeah, just, it, the opposite were true. It was just really awkward. I just didn't feel they yeah. had any chemistry either. It was just a bit weird how they, yeah, how their their interaction just felt quite false to me. Um, mm-hmm. I thought she was a fairly good character otherwise, um, but I didn't think she needed to have that romantic connection with Picard. All right, yeah. great stuff. Thank you very much, Eve. You may step down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Allison Leach Hyde, what's up? How are you? What do you think of this one? I'm I mean, I love the episode. It's it has all the things we love about Star Trek in it. We are defining or not even defining, exploring what it means to be alive and considered an individual and a human. And we have used the term human for everyone, <laughs> really, in the end. And so I love that. I thought all the actors brought their A game. You know, Maddox was great. Philippa Laveau was great. I'm a little sad we didn't get a lot of Jordy. That is in the extended edition of this episode. If you can get your hands on it, there is more Jordy in it. And it's a wonderful scene because, I mean, they're best friends. There should be more scenes with Jordy and Data in this. This is, you know, really, I mean, when going through something hard you want your best friend with you so that's that's my criticism of this episode is there should be more Jordy, but that's my criticism of almost every episode that there should be more Jordy. So, um yeah <laughs> nakamura when he comes onto the bridge and just like offhandedly just says oh commander maddox is here to disassemble your android i'm like what <laughs> that's an actual <laughs> being like we talk about disassembling things that are broken to make them better, you know, but we know data is not broken. So that word got me like right in the beginning. I'm like, no. <laughs> and always since a kid, I'm just like, we can't use that word. He's a, he's an individual. We can't do that. You can't take him apart to make more of them. So that's, you know, that's horrible. Like you, he's not that. And shout out to O'Brien getting to be in the first poker game. For yes. next mm, yes. That's a great floor to be in. So I'm going to end it there. But those are those are my happies and sads for the episode. Oh, that's fun. Happies and sads. Mm-hmm. It's very, very happy to see O'Brien. Yeah, in the very first poker uh, game that we see. Chris McGee, what's up? It's the Dark Lord. What do you think of this one? Oh, I hated this episode. No. I've only seen it at least a dozen <laughs> times, you know. Uh, so much so that I even went to a theater to watch the extended cut of the episode back um, when they were promoting oh, wow. uh, Blu-ray season two, which is on the Blu-ray, actually, if you want to watch the extended version of it. Um, the dialogue was just so incredibly well written data's question about replacing all human officers eyes with cybernetic implants that was just so powerful i thought and i mean what more can be said as melissa brought up the guinan bringing up the point of slavery was just absolutely perfect absolutely just just hit you like a ton of bricks like she said um I will say uh, any fans of this episode, besides myself, of course, go check it. If you haven't already, check out the Legal Eagle video on YouTube that discusses this episode. 
I think it's quite interesting. Maybe it's just because I'm a sucker for courtroom dramas. It's the reason why I love Ad Astra Per Aspera from Strange New Worlds. Um, but it, I think it's uh, quite interesting. On the technical side, uh, Data mentions uh, he has a storage capacity of, of 800 quadrillion bits. You may have already talked about this earlier. I don't know, but <laughs> I'll go ahead and mention that that is equivalent to about 100 petabytes or 100,000 terabytes. That's a little bit more relatable. Right now, the largest computer in the world, the uh, the Summit, where at least it was as of 2020, I don't know about now, but uh, the Summit by IBM um, has 250 petabytes of storage, so more than doubling that. Um, to bring it to something a little bit more relatable, maybe for those of us who are familiar with graphics cards for com desktop computers, in NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090, which was released, again, about in 2020, um, has between 29 and 35 trillion operations per second. So if data has 60 trillion operations per second, one of those video cards is about half a data, wow. so to speak. So is he um, smarter than my iPhone 12 or not? <laughs> yeah, bring it, bring it we'll home, that one Chris. Out. <laughs> Maybe, right. yeah. Come on, Chris. Bring it, you know, narrow the, the thing. Yeah. Bandwidth. Can I, can I pull it? Can I Google it? <laughs> <laughs> is he better than Google? Yeah. Ooh, is Dana that's a good question. What about chat GPT, though? Mm. <laughs> right. It is chat. I'm going to ride with data on this one. <laughs> As for the memorable quote of the episode, holy cow, there are so many because I've seen this so often. I, I almost know it by heart, almost every line. I had to pick one, though, so I went with I went with the, the one that I thought was the most uh, interesting. I don't know how else to describe it, and that is ineffable quality. Mm -hmm. Very good. And you've got that ineffable quality, Chris. Uh, TJ Jackson Bay is here. His quality is very effable and we love it. Um, <laughs> what do you think of this one? <laughs> oh man, this episode, I, I could not Wait. talk enough about it. So I'll have a lot of stuff for things left unsaid. Uh, but for right now, uh, a couple of points that really jumped out at me is, uh, in the ready room, uh, when data made the comparison, you know, to replacing all human eyes. Really, what he was doing was calling out a hidden bias in Picard because Picard, you know, was like you know, he kind of took a step back and said, you know, you know, whoa, for a moment, you know, I didn't think about it like that. And uh, to Picard's credit, rather than get defensive and try to defend that bias, you know, he recognized and addressed it and said, I, I need to rethink, you know, how I'm looking at what's happening here. Um, and I think that's an example we could all learn for, from. Uh, also, um, you know, when Data was speaking in his defense, um, one of the things that he said was that the substance and the flavor of the moment would be lost when he was uh, making that comparison. And, you know, that made me realize that Data understands and, and, and intrinsically what a soul is and has one. Uh, and, you know, that's something we kind of, uh, you know, thought about before when uh, Dr. Graves replaced him. Uh, but when Dr. Graves was downloaded back into the computer, it was just information. So there's some factor to, you know, the construction and experience that data has that makes him alive. That's not just regular data. See what I did there? Data. Yeah. data. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, someone mentioned this. Uh, I think it was Eve uh, that Dr. Pulaski was at his going away party. Um but not only that, you know, so, you know, for all the the non Pulaski fans out there, I'm a Pulaski fan. Uh, Data quoted Pulaski uh, <laughs> when he was talking about, you know, life is rarely fair. And so uh, not only has Pulaski grown in this relationship, but Data reciprocates. And so, you know, I think that's more points in favor of uh, Dr. Pulaski for those that that don't like her based on the fact that they started off in a little bit of a rocky relationship. Um, all right. Second to last, um, when Riker is given his presentation and he takes data's hands off, 
Uh, I thought that uh, the the actress that played Philippa Lavoie uh, did a wonderful job uh, because she kind of jumped and was shocked and the look on her face was like, you know, oh my God, I ordered Riker to do this. I did not think he was going to go this far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and so just without, without a line, without, you know, anything with just the camera on her, you know, she was able to, to just kind of sell that moment for me. And I, and I thought that was exceptional. Um, and, um, this course, you know, makes mention of, of course, this, uh, episode makes one of the mentions of my favorite subjects, which is metaphysics. Uh, when Lavoie is, uh, summing things up, she says, this case is dealt with metaphysics. You know, it's, it's dipping into subjects that, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that are just, you know, beyond, you know, black and white you know letter of the law you know type of stuff um and i'll add more in things left unsaid but i have so much to say about uh the guinan and picard scene mm-hmm. uh that I, I won't even start into it here but i'll you know i'll end with a line kind of like chris did and this is one that always gets me when i watch this episode uh, and it's in Picard's, you know, when Picard is basically, you know, slamming the door on this case, he asks Maddox, you know, <laughs> what if data meets your third criteria, even in the least, which is consciousness? What is he then? And he turns around to everyone and says, do you know? Do you? Do you? And and that's that's it. There's no question after that. So I'll end on that note and mm-hmm. add more later. Great stuff. Thank you very much. TJ. Look, it's Dr. Susan V. Gruner. Hello, Susan. Welcome back. It's been a little bit of time. We missed you. What would you think of this episode? Well, let's just start right from the beginning. Can you see this? (laughs) (laughs) It's a 10, she says. (laughs) But I just make that clear right now. Uh, I love this episode. I love the storytelling. The way they layered it, what we're its relevance within the whole idea of what they were talking about. What I mean specifically is they start with the poker game with Dr. Pulaski playing poker with Data and Riker and everybody. That is just great. It shows their friends. And uh, I just love that. Um, They showed Data packing and how he's packing the book and then the little thing with Tasha, all the things that mean something to him. He's thinking about this. So they're they're getting us set up for the, the rest of the show. I think this show should be required watching for certain people in the United States right now. It's relevant today. And people need a little reminder of some things. And uh, that's all I'll say about that. But uh, it was a great episode. Uh, I love Guinan and her purple stuff. Oh, man, purple is just such a great <laughs> color for her. Uh, <laughs> purple is just a great color, period. But uh, yeah, it was well done. Uh, very Star Trek. Loved it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love it. The purple in your hair is awesome, too, by the way. For anybody just mm-hmm. listening in, uh, purple's great on Sue as well. Uh, Mai is live in Tokyo. What's up, Mai? What did you think of this one? Um, great episode, but it's always been very hard for me to watch. And now, 34 years after its initial release, doubly so. Um, we either have not learned or as a society have willfully ignored the need to consider all of our citizens as equals. Um, this episode sought to be relevant social commentary in 89, and it was. Um, what's a tragedy is that racism in the U.S. has not only gone unchecked since then, but gotten far worse and more sinister. Um, couple that with the increase in social awareness regarding gender identity as a spectrum. Yet the laws in the U.S. make life nearly unbearable for people who identify differently than their sex assigned at birth. I think the the quote by Maddox says it all. He's like, rights, rights. I'm sick to death of hearing about rights. Um, And Guinan's quote takes us back to the days of legal slavery in the U.S. as well as to the concentration camps in World War II. You don't have to think about their welfare. You don't think about how they feel. Whole generations of disposable people. Her acting is amazing, but one thing you could not hide was the intensity of emotion as she was speaking about this. The the clenching of her right temple tells us all we need to know about how she feels about that when she's speaking those lines. It was just 
she conveyed it right there with that that temple pulsing right there. Um, the pers persistent misgendering of biomatics of data was incredibly painful to watch. I wanted to throw something very heavy at my TV yet again. Uh, this could have been a court of cisgender people trying the case of a trans person, but as it was, it was a court of white people trying the case of a silver-skinned individual. Maybe in another 34 years, America will be able to hold its head up higher than it's entitled to do today. Um, but we need not only hope, we can continue to spread the love and true kindness as seen every day in the hearts, the words, the deeds of the people that participate in this seventh rule community. This microcosm is what the whole country should be like. So I guess in summation, great episode, very lacking social response. That's it. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Mai. Mm. Uh, Carrie Schwent is here, a.k.a. Crafty Bear. Your thoughts? Oh, so, so many, so many thoughts. I have a few fun tidbits that I'll save for afterwards, including why I picked this particular T-shirt. But we'll save that for later. I hadn't watched this episode in probably a really long time. The pretty much the only Star Star Trek series that I really rewatched on a regular basis was Voyager. I hadn't really done very many rewatches of Next Gen. Now I'd almost forgotten uh, like a lot of the details of this of this episode. And pro and because of going going through all three seasons of Picard, and then going through the Next Gen episodes in depth the way we have been and the way. I do when I take notes on literally every single scene. It like takes me four hours to document one episode. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to show you guys sometime. But I was un unprepared when I when I watched it the first time before I took my notes of just the emotional roller coaster that this episode takes you on, and the scene that really the one. Tiny little scene, and it has no dialogue whatsoever. That kind of encapsulates that roller coaster. Is when Riker's doing his homework for the hearing, and he's pulling up data schematics, and he sees something, and he's like, "I can use that. That'll win me the case." Oh crap! That'll win me the case. Just that whole emotional roller co roller coaster that he goes on, and the only toast toasters I want. I want that are around those those are the Cylons on Battlestar Galactica. Those are the only toasters. Mm -hmm. And even and even in that show they use that as very much a as as a slur towards the metal mm -hmm. versions of, of the Cylons. And that that whole series kind of relates to this episode relates to this episode too. But I will finish by going a, a bit philosophical and I, I present for the defense the the following exhibit d for data there is no easy way to measure a man so many facets we must understand even with no emotions how does one show devotion and become wiser than we began Great Little stuff. For thought there. Mm -hmm. Thank you and very I'm much, very Carrie. prepared to measure all sorts of things with my background. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm not touching wow. that. I had, had to bring a little funny. <laughs> uh, and also, shout out to Ronald D. Moore, uh, showrunner of Battlestar Galactica. Good knowledge, mm -hmm. Carrie. Mm -hmm. What's up, Justin all. Weir? Uh, what do you think of <laughs> hello, this? Hello, hello. Oh, this is a great episode. I I'm going to keep it light, though, because I started taking notes. And as soon as the courtroom stuff starts happening, I kind of just zone out because of how good it is. Um, I It's crazy to me. So this is the flagship Enterprise and you have the bridge crew. And this doctor can just get an order to take one of the bridge crew away without anyone consulting Picard like that. I was like, that's that's a little weird. Maybe they he convinced them that we could get a bunch of datas, and they went w with that. Um, I thought it funny during the courtroom scene that uh, when Data was first on the stand and he listed all of his medals, and Picard was like, "I want to hear all this," but when Maddox takes the the same seat, he goes, "All right, yes, yes, we get it. You're you're a genius." <laughs> um, I thought the music was fantastic. It really set this uh, the tone for each scene. 
Like when Data was packing, it was real light. But as soon as Maddox walks in, the tone just went. You could you could feel it got more intense. Um, yeah, the poker scene, Data wearing a visor, little things like that. It's hilarious. He's just he's the car guy, so he's got the visor on. And uh, I've heard a lot of great lines, but my favorite line came from Picard when he said, "I've been trying to make sense of this gobbledygook, but it's beyond me." <laughs> but yeah, great episode. It's uh, nice to see you all. Mm-hmm. Great seeing you too. Great shirt. Yeah. Isn't gobbledygook a line from? Jeez, uh... I've been uh, uh, The the movie with uh, the chocolate factory. Oh, sure. really? Wong 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 it is a it is a no. fairly common British word. We do use that. Oh, word. is it? Yeah, okay. it just means sort of all jumbled up. It doesn't make sense. Hmm. Oh, that's gobbledygook. Yeah. <laughs> Without gobbledygook, I wouldn't say a thing. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Denise, you like True. that one a little too much. <laughs> True. All right. I'll, I'll bring it down a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to put myself on mute. <laughs> never. Never. Please, never. <laughs> uh, Faith Howell is here. What's up, Faith? Uh, what do you think of this episode? So, um, historically, I this is not one of my favorite episodes. Um, mm. I think especially watching it as a as a young child, TJ, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm coming from it from data's data's my bud. You know, I'm I'm three years old probably at the time this was first airing, and and oh god, data don't was, rub it in, Faith. Data was <laughs> sorry, guys. But, you know, but but data was the coolest thing out there at that time. And I was totally in love with him. And so to come in and try to attack data was not happening. And so I'm coming from that point, watching this episode fresh after a few years and um, it definitely hit different. And I really appreciated the touchstones to some pretty, you know, memorable, um, uh, sci-fi, like written sci-fi. Um, some of you guys probably can give better titles than I could right off the top of your heads, but um, I think some of the the most memorable things re-watching this episode um, were like looking at Maddox and thinking about how, how how can you stand against someone joining Starfleet in the first place and then yeah. Once they're in Starfleet, now that you you're property of Starfleet, that that logic doesn't pan out for me. Um, I also really loved that little moment where that I, I definitely missed until this rewatch um, where Data says, um, I, I gave my word and it hit me. Um, it never happened. And I was like, oh, my God, I know you guys probably got that. But I, that was my first like, oh. That's so sweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I did I did the math too, Chris. Um, and and definitely date is faster than my iPhone by a lot. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Because he's an right. Android. Yeah. <laughs> ah, oh. very good. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you, Faith. Uh Goldie Scott, what's up? What do you got for us today? This is the first time I have watched this, this particular episode in so extremely, such so, so many years, particularly since uh, we have seen season one of Picard. So boy, do we know what is coming to Maddox in the distant future. Um, we also know what he does do, regardless of what he learns at the end of this episode as well. And um, as Faith was saying, I do, I, I did pull a lot of the similarities from some golden age sci-fi with particularly like Asimov's uh, robot stories that led into Foundation and a lot of his questioning on what makes sentience and what makes a, a, a living being. And there's some Clifford Simic stuff in there, too, as well as some like Bradbury's Martian Chronicles is really like asking the questions of what what is human? You know, human is is a very broad term in this. But I do find that this is really the episode. I will go ahead and admit that I don't relate to data as much as a lot of other folks do. And I know that that is definitely, you know, data Spock Odo does it 
a lot of people can can grab on to relate to data but this is the first episode where i feel like i really do catch what's going on and i like that it does so easily lay out empathy right in front of you because at the very beginning of the episode you're like of course data's of course of course and then you're pissed by the end of it because you're like they, they better leave him alone leave him alone so i love the the gradual um show it um uh, don't say it but show it throughout and while they are you know there's plenty of dialogue and stuff but yeah the whole episode great definitely i will say that this is so far my favorite episode of the the series and i think it's up there with inner light which we'll talk about later mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh. stay tuned for wow. that one uh good stuff thank you gold do scott uh jason oaken is here from abroad somewhere uh what do you think of this episode hi everybody uh to me, uh, frankly, that this is a Star Trek classic, probably uh, up up there with the best of them all. It certainly comes down from you know from the lineage of courtroom dramas that Star Trek has done before. Certainly from Court Martial of the original series in the Menagerie, and it's it's certainly not the last time Star Trek has tried this. Sometimes not so successfully with the matter of perspective, and sometimes really successfully with the drumhead, which I think is probably one of maybe my favorite next gen episode. But we'll get to that uh, down the line. Uh, yeah, a lot has been said about it, and I, uh, I'll say you know some some of the details for later in terms of you know how the script turned out and and, and Denise uh, what I've been saying actually uh, for a lot of the episodes of the second season was surprised the hell out of me is how much doctoring how much great doctoring has been going on into the scripts from I guess their earlier versions to the last and this is actually no exception I mean it's a great script by Melinda Snodgrass but I think you know. There's quite a bit of interesting doctor went on there. I think the scene with Picard and Guinan was rewritten almost entirely. Ooh, yeah. It's not like that in the script at all. Uh, there was a lot more about sort of this relationship between uh, Picard and Lavoie. Uh, they, they sort of had this uh, kind of a, a literally a lover's relationship. There's a lot more of that in the script, and that's probably why this whole thing about the sexy man is there. It's in the original script. It's in there. Hmm. And it fit a lot more from that perspective because that's what the, uh, a lot of what they were talking about. But in, again, it's, it just turned out to be a classic. And I think the way it was doctored up a little bit and the way it turned out is tremendous. I think the performance is great. Um, I mean, most of the time, I'm not a big fan of the meat and potatoes type of directing. And here it certainly was. And I guess for courtroom, courtroom drama where you basically sit in a room, and this could be actually done as a stage play if you really wanted to. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is more of a stage play type mm-hmm. thing, and, 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 and I, would I would really love did, to see. I that. would love to watch that on stage. This, this would have been terrific to just kind of sit there and experience something like that. And I think the performance is terrific. I think Patrick is great in this. I think there's a lot of sort of passion in here, uh, and certainly, you know, uh, Frakes' performance. I mean, I know the sort of reaction when he learns that you know he's about to uh, do some damage to David. That's actually in the script. He actually tell, it says that he's supposed to react that way. Actually, the data's cap is also in the script, which is kind of interestingly described. And uh, what I found really interesting is uh, uh, Pulaski's presence in the poker game. It was not in the original script. It was put in there. And, uh, and her lines were actually spoken by O'Brien. Some of those lines got taken away from him hmm. and uh, uh, given to Dr. Pulaski, which is great. I think uh, her presence there was tremendous. And I think it was important. And... Uh, uh, the last thing I'll say is, you know, a, a lot of times when things are cut from an episode or from a movie, uh, you know, they slow down pacing. They aren't exactly great. But if you watch the extended version, I think it really sort of adds to this quite a lo- quite a bit. There's a lot more uh, in terms of character that goes into this. Uh, it's just a tremendous episode. And I think, you know, the way it turned out both in terms of performances and in terms of the way the script uh, was, was finished was absolutely great. And uh Again, I enjoyed it tremendously the first time, the second time, and however many times I watched it, and, and certainly now. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Jason Oaken, the Matt Boardman is here. What's up, Matt? What do you think of this one? Hey, uh, this is, you know, this is a fantastic episode. Um, I don't know if, if anybody else had this, probably did, but... Uh, back in the '90s, late '90s, there was uh, they did a digital version of the Star Trek Encyclopedia that had little video clips and this courtroom scene where where Picard is, you know, doing the "Do you do you" was on there, and it was one that I used to watch over and over because it was the I don't know it's uh, it's such a powerful moment to me. Um, and today, as I was watching it through again, it reminded me of a few good men. 
which mm-hmm. is uh which is a favorite movie of mine um and i you know i i love that that final interaction where where colonel jessup just loses loses it right and um and i for some reason was reminded of that today um but another quick thing i remember back in 94 when next generation was about to go off the air they did uh, a series of episodes that were voted as fan favorites and this was one of those episodes that that was in that uh group of of episodes but um there's just I, i'm sure everybody has talked about so many things because clearly my uh my timing is not digital and i showed up a half hour late and uh <laughs> and so i don't so there there are a few things that i'm sure that i missed but i don't know if it was discussed uh where the name of the title came from Mm-hmm. Um, which I thought was interesting because it popped up as a little like, you know, did you know on uh, Amazon? Um, and it says that the title comes from a statement by Plato, which said <clears throat> the measure of man is what he does with power. But then it goes on to say that the the direct source for this episode, however, is most likely Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s version, which he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And that, that hit me. That was really, really powerfully because I mean, of of things that everybody has talked about in in relation to uh, a defining moment of, of how as, as human beings, as, as the, the Federation, how do we treat this group of, of you know this synthetic life you know and 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 is that not a reflection upon us as a society how we choose to treat i don't know i'm weird i choose i even my alexa i like say thank you and everything too because the day that uh you know our robot overlords come over and take over i want to be among the the you know the ones that they choose not to eliminate um <laughs> But, uh, but I, I just, I don't know, that has always been something that has been, uh, that I was raised with that, that has been instilled in my soul is that, that, you know, a reflection of who we are is, is in how we treat other people. Um, and, the, and then one last final thing, I, to me, this is one of the most significant things of this episode is, is when everything is said and done, look at how data treats Maddox. I mean, here is a man who wanted to take him and disassemble him and, you know, dump his core memory and, and, and do whatever, you know, with the very distinct possibility to destroy and eliminate data from existence. And yet when everything is said and done, data walks up to him and he says, you know what? I find that there is some merit in what you have proposed. And I am curious to see where things go from here. Mm. And and that to me is a, it's a lesson in forgiveness. It's a it's a lesson that uh, you know I think a lot. Of, and I, I don't want to get into politics and stuff like that, but but I feel like where it, it's to me that is significant in the world that we live in right now. And I, I find that that is amazing. An amazing thing about Star Trek is that no matter what year that we live in, there is something that pertains to our current situation. And I think that there is a lesson to be gained there by by treating people with civility and with forgiveness and with love, despite how they might despitefully use us. Um, and then, I mean, and then again, Riker at the end there, who was injured by what he had to do, but, but data, you know, showed that, that love for Riker, you know, you in, you know, this action injured you, but it helped me and I will forever be grateful for that. Excellent. Thank you very much, the Matt Boardman. Well, big day. Final thoughts, uh, Denise and Sirac. Wow! Just like always, I'm I've, I'm I'm I've got this one idea going on in my head, and then I listen to you guys, and I'm like, oh <laughs> wow, okay, that's happening. Um, well, this was this was um, really wonderful for me to to be here with you guys and and watch this episode. This is the first time I've ever seen it. Um, you know, I certainly have heard of. Oh, look at okay, of um, <laughs> of you know um, of measure of a man, the measure of a man over the years, and. So, you know, 
and it always shows up as as one of the fan favorites. And so I, but I never had the opportunity or the the, the wherewithal to sit down and watch it, you know, until until this. And that's that that is um, really a gift for me to experience. I I really loved everything about it um uh, the provocation the thought that that w- the, what we're grappling with and and the seamless um um layering of of the issues of you know sentient beings and property and how this this comes into play how we really put these two elements on trial and it's it's really something that you know we're still we're we're still grappling with they're gra- this is just um an endless sort of ev- evolution of who we are and grappling still with the, these issues um i think having you know you guys will see the the earlier segment with melinda um snodgrass who who wrote this and it was really illuminating and i don't want to i don't want to give any spoilers but you know the fact that she came out of you know the blue here with this script and just mm-hmm. just uh, broke a lot of barriers and held her own at, with such a powerful uh, piece of writing was um, you know was 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 really uh, uh, you know something to behold. She's tremendous, and you guys will get a chance to to see her. So yeah, it it. For me too, it 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 introduces something that will that will um, be grounded forever in the kind of lore of Star Trek: The Next Generation, and that is the relationship with Data and Tasha. It it by 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 him holding on to that hologram and as as a significant piece in his life um it really it'll it'll you know it it bookmarks on the other end of you know it it it, it of picard you know we'll we'll see how it all kind of comes together that and and resolves a lot of what i couldn't do in the final um uh ho- my hologram it delivered in um skin of evil so it sort of it sort of puts puts a nice bow around that uh and i i i hadn't seen that i i wasn't aware of that you know when when ryan when you called me and said you know you should come come on for measure of man because it there is there is an element of tasha Yar, and i went a lot there is yeah so but mm. but much more than just showing that hologram it really signifies how this relationship is part of who this that you know this this who what this show is about you know that Tasha is still very present so it was it was really wonderful to to kind of see that and know that mm-hmm. well I'm just gonna expand on the um the Dred Scott decision which was was really the thing that kind of led to the civil war and um in the dred scott decision the supreme chief justice uh taney he wrote that um you know the court, court ruled that people of african descent quote are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. Further went on to say that, quote, a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery. Now that's the the quote from the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time. 
mentioning that there was supposed to be a perpetual and impassable barrier between the races. And, you know, that made me think about rights being stripped away. It made me think about um, the feeling of not being included and feeling hopeless. And I felt that data kind of encapsulated those feelings when uh, Picard, you know, said to him, well, this is the situation and you, uh, this is what the deal is. And he says, well, I guess I've been reduced to only one option. I think that was the the line that he gave. Um, And that's the problem is being reduced to, to only one option in life and only have one, one road that you can travel. And that's, that is what um, handicaps or restricts us from being able to be ourselves and be free. When you only have a certain lane you can travel and you're not allowed to divert from that lane. Um, and I think they address that kind of uh, that mentality and how it has long term ramifications, um, which they address in this episode, talking about what this precedence would mean going forward in the future. And I think that if we think about our actions in a way that we are thinking about kinds of precedences being set in the future, um, then we can be more responsible about how we behave um, in the present. So I, I think that's an important correlation that we made in this episode. Our rock dropping bars right there, man. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, do you have more? No, that's it. That's it. All right. So the rest. We'll all collect ourselves now for a minute. Uh, (laughs) That was amazing. (laughs) Thank you, Sarah. Uh, All right. And thank you, Melissa, Eve, Allison, Chris, TJ, Justin, Carrie, Mai, Sue, Faith, Goldu Scott, Jason the Outrageous Ogan, and the Matt Boardman. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you to Denise Crosby for coming back yeah, to co-host man. with us again. <laughs> we are forever fortunate Any for that. Anytime. I've missed you all. Oh, my God. What goodness. a surprise. I'm a little rusty. I'm a little rusty. <laughs> uh, so for Denise, myself, Sirach, Melissa, and of course, Mr. Aaron Eisenberg, thank you all very much for joining us. And until then, always remember the seventh rule.